Okay, so we're working on our second worksheet here. Uh, and just as a reminder, I think that the best way to use these worksheets is to go ahead and work on the worksheet prior to listening to the feedback. Uh, and then once you've kind of struggled through that, come back and listen to that feedback and hopefully that will be a better learning opportunity for you. Again, these are uh, optional worksheets. They are meant to help you understand the material and enrich uh, what is being presented in, of course, uh, the, the class and the Echo 360 recordings. Um, so in this second worksheet, we're thinking more along the lines of Lecture 2. Uh, and in Lecture 2, we're, of course, talking about how glucose is absorbed uh, not only into the body from the small intestine, but also once it gets into the body, how it's being absorbed by the various tissue types, okay, through these glute transporters. And in a multicellular organism such as you and I, it's quite interesting when we start to consider uh, how glucose is absorbed by different tissue types because different tissue types have different uh, functions, they have different responsibilities, uh, they use energy um, from a variety of different nutrients in different ways. And because of that, then they will interact with glucose from the bloodstream in very different ways. To give you an example, uh, the pancreas, which is something that we'll talk about today, is a very important tissue in terms of detecting blood glucose concentration levels and then adjusting the secretion of different hormones, insulin and glucagon, so as to ensure that the rest of the body knows that there is either a high concentration of glucose in the blood or a low concentration of glucose in the blood. And these insulin and glucagon hormones will then affect the physiology of very different tissue types. Right, so that's one tissue that will have to interact with the glucose in the blood in a very different way than say some other tissue like neurons or muscles or adipose tissue or something along those lines and we'll kind of highlight some of those differences. Now those differences interestingly in terms of their function okay are in part regulated and controlled and dictated by the type of glute transporter that is found in the membrane of the cells of that particular tissue type. Okay, and there are lots of different glute transporters and the glute transporters have different kinetic properties. Now, we're certainly not gonna go over all the glute transporters in this class and all their kinetic properties and even regulatory properties, but we have and will discuss some of them or many of them. Okay, um, so for instance, in this worksheet, we'll highlight the differences between GLUT3 and GLUT2 and GLUT4 and GLUT2. Okay, um, and we'll talk about that in terms of the function um, of that particular tissue and how that GLUT transporter is going to be instrumental in determining that function or helping along in that function. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at activity one. Now again, go ahead and pause it. If you haven't done activity one, work your way through it and then come back and let's do this. Okay, so it says in activity one, the table below has two different glute transporters and they're listed KM or KT values. Okay, your book uses KT. KM is an accepted um, substitution for that. KT value, okay, so either one of those is fine. It's just nomenclature. Okay, they mean exactly the same thing. Given this information, please do the following. Okay, now we're looking at those transporters. GLUT3 has a KM or KT of 1 millimolar, and GLUT2 has a uh, KM or KT of 17 millimolar. Okay, now just so we have some understanding, okay, of this, understand that that KM or that KT value is the concentration of substrate, in this case glucose, that would be required for 50% of the maximum velocity to be achieved. Okay, so in other words, the GLUT3 transporter will only take one millimolar concentration of glucose to reach 50% of its maximal output, or really input if you're thinking about absorption into the cell, whereas GLUT2 is going to take a concentration of glucose at 17 millimolar. Okay, that's a significant difference, and we could say that then the GLUT3 transporter has a significantly higher affinity for glucose than the um, GLUT2 transporter. Okay, now let's go ahead and move on here and it says this calculate the percent v max for uh, each glute transporter at four millimolar 
and 8 millimolar glucose concentration. Okay, now what, what's the deal with 4 and 8? Well, 4 and 8 represent the very low ends of glucose concentration in the blood, and 8 millimolar are the very high ends. Okay, you get much below 4 millimolar concentration of glucose, and you're in considered a hypoglycemic state, which can be very dangerous to the body. You get above 8 millimolar glucose concentrations, and you would be considered a hyperglycemic state, and that can be dangerous as well. All right, so um, the body uh, works hard, and this would really be the function of the pancreas in conjunction with the other tissues, um, in particular the liver, the muscle, and adipose tissue, um, in keeping and maintaining the concentration of glucose between 8 and 4 millimolar. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and first of all calculate these percent D maxes for these glute transporters. Okay, um, and so let's first of all just write out the Michaelis Benton equation. Okay, um, so this is the VO equals V max times substrate concentration over KM or KT, whatever you want to put there, plus substrate concentration. Okay, so there is our equation that we need to be working with okay and let's go ahead um, and do this let's just make a table here and we will put glute three right here okay and let's go ahead and um, state that this is going to be four millimolar that's our glucose concentration in the blood okay so what would be the Vmax for this. Now, in the the lecture, I gave you some way to do this. There's a, a couple of ways to do this. Let me show you um, this way, okay? Uh, and that is going to be this. We can simply write out the equation as this: Vmax. Actually, let me give myself enough room to do this. There we go. We'll just say Vmax times our substrate concentration, which in this case is 4 millimolar, so I'm just going to put a 4 here, divided by Km, which is, remember going back to our, because we're in glute 3, our table is 1, okay, plus 4. Okay, and I'm leaving off the units millimolar, but 4 millimolar, 1 millimolar, and 4 millimolar would be our units. Okay, and what that means is this, that our GLUT3 transporter is at four-fifths of the Vmax, okay, which is equal to 0 0.80 of the Vmax. Okay, and if we want to put that in percentage, this would be 80% of the Vmax. Okay, at that particular uh, glucose concentration in the bloodstream. Okay, All right now. We could go further and say, okay, well, what is it then an 8 millimolar? Well, we'll do something very similar. I won't draw it all out this time, okay, but we would do Vmax times 8, okay, because that's our substrate concentration. Our Km remains unchanged, plus 8, which means that we are really um, 8 ninths of Vmax. Okay, which means that from a percentage standpoint, we're at like 89% of the max. Okay, so those are our two values of activity for the GLUT3 transporter at the two extreme ends of our glucose concentration in the bloodstream. Okay, now let's come over here and let's make another column. Okay. And let's call this one GLUT2 because that's our other transporter that we're looking at. And of course, the KM is quite a bit different. The calculation will be very similar to this. Okay, um, and so I'll use a different color pencil here, but um, or pen here. And so what I would get to essentially, I'm not going to write it all out because I'll run out of room if I do. Um, but essentially, what I would get to in this case would be um, four over 21 of the Vmax. Okay, because what I would have to do is substitute this value for not 1, but 17. And of course, 17 plus 4 is 21. And that means that we are sitting here at a very low output for this transporter at 19% of its Vmax. Okay, come down here and we'd have something very similar to this, but it'd be 8 
over 25 of the Vmax, which would be 32% of the Vmax, or about 32%. Okay, and again, we have to substitute 17 for this, and of course, 17 plus 8 is 25. Okay, and so that's our Vmax values for a GLUT2 at the two extremes. Okay, it's actually at fairly low capacity. Okay, when you think about it in, in terms of its total maximal velocity, and the reason is, is because its KM is so large. Okay, if the Km represents the substrate concentration at 50% of the Vmax, well, that's 17 millimolar. Well, when you have, of course, a, a substrate concentration of 8, you're going to be not quite 50%. Uh, In fact, you'll be all the way down to 32%. Okay? Now, the real question is, okay, that's great. I see that, right? I mean, we have a 9-point um, uh, difference between, um, uh, you know, the Vmaxes. Or the percent Vmaxes of GLUT3 and a and a 13 percent or 13 um, yeah percent difference um, between the Vmaxes and GLUT2. But what does this mean, okay, physiologically? Well, this is where it's really helpful to actually calculate something that we would consider um, or call the percent increase, right? So percent increase is a very helpful tool to look at here, and essentially the percent increase. Um, Let's go ahead and put that up here. The equation for that is percent increase. Oops. There we go. Oops. Percent increase is equal to essentially your final value minus your initial value divided by your initial value times 100. Okay, All right. So in this case, we could say that let's envision a scenario in which we are going from four millimolar concentration of glucose to eight millimolar concentration of glucose. So someone has just eaten a meal and they have this large increase in the concentration of glucose in their bloodstream, right? So we go from, in this case, our initial value would be 80% and our final value would be 89%. So we would say then that we would want to go 89% minus 80 over 80. Okay, and then we multiply that by 100. And what you would get here is that there would be an 11.3% increase in the absorption capacity of GLUT3 and the tissues that then express GLUT3 uh, in their membrane. Okay, so not a huge percent increase, right? It's not this massive uh, increase um, because you're already close to the maximal value of its absorption capacity, right? And so there's this 11.3% increase. Now, let's do the same thing, okay, for GLUT2. Again, using this as our, our initial value and 32 as our final value, so we would get then 32 minus 19 over 19, okay? And that's going to equal then, oh, I have to multiply that by 100, sorry. And that's going to be a 68% increase. Well, that's fairly significant, especially when you start to compare these two values to each other, okay? Right now, that goes on, right, in activity one. It says, well, having done the above, calculating the percent increase, and also our percent of Vmax, having done the above, now give a possible explanation for why GLUT3 is found primarily in neurons and GLUT2 is found primarily in the pancreatic beta cells and the, the hepatocytes, okay, hepatocytes being the liver cells. Okay, well, let's think about the function of these two different tissue types, okay? So uh, the neuron, the neuron, of course, we think about it functionally, it's going to send neuronal impulses, um, that allow, uh, allow for motor movement. Of course, there is the non-voluntary movement that we have in our in our bodies, the heartbeats, all sorts of things. Um, all of our thought processes, all the functions of the brain are carried out by the neurons, okay? The neurons are quite literally working all the time, okay? And it's very important that then they maintain a fairly high level of ATP in their cells. And interestingly, neuronal tissue will use almost exclusively for its energy needs, glucose, 
Okay, so essentially the neuronal tissue is going to stick a straw out into the bloodstream and it's going to pull the glucose that it needs irregardless of what the rest of the body needs for glucose. It's just going to suck down glucose. In fact, um, it, the brain and neuronal tissue will use about 120 grams of glucose of the 160 grams of glucose that are used on a daily basis. So it is the major user of glucose. Okay, and so what we see here then, when we look at this percent increase, when there is this large increase in the uh, glucose concentration of the blood, it doubles. Okay that doesn't lead to a significant increase in the neuron's ability to absorb glucose because it needs to absorb almost as efficiently glucose um, in low glucose concentrations and high glucose concentrations and that's what we're seeing here because those neurons become equipped with or come equipped with GLUT3 okay which is a very efficient and has a high affinity for it's a very efficient glute transporter and has a high affinity for glucose now compare that to, to then the glute 2 transporters okay and we'll specifically focus on the pancreatic beta cells <clears throat> pancreatic beta cells are really the body's detector okay of glucose concentration really the pancreas as a whole okay um, is the detector of blood glucose concentrations, meaning that it needs to know, okay, when or be able to detect when concentrations of glucose are going low and concentrations of glucose are coming high, okay? And you'll notice then here between our two extremes, there is a 68% increase, or if we go in the opposite direction, glucose levels are going down, 68% decrease, okay, in its ability to absorb glucose. Well, that's going to have a fairly massive effect on the physiology within the intracellular environment of the cell. And that change in physiology is going to be detected by the pancreatic beta cell. And in response, it's going to secrete insulin. Okay. Or if it's the alpha cell, it will secrete glucagon. Okay. And those then hormones are going to have fairly massive effects on a whole on the body in terms of of um, telling the body to either many tissues in the body to absorb glucose or in the case of like the, the liver to make glucose if blood, blood glucose concentrations are going down and those are all accomplished by these hormonal signals sent out by the pancreas okay so glute 2 then becomes a very appropriate um, glute transporter for the pancreas so that it can detect changes in glucose concentrations is very sensitive to those changes and then produce the insulin or the glucagon that's needed to signal to the other tissues as far as what they need to do to either bring blood glucose concentrations down or to bring them up okay all right so fascinating stuff isn't this fascinating stuff okay um, and that's all based off of right michaelis minson kinetics and these glute transporters okay now let's go on and let's look at activity two okay so now we're going to look at glute four um, and let me just get a different color here um, let's use here i guess you know it's a very interesting coloring scheme i've got going here i'm not sure why i did it the way i did it but i did okay so but glute four it has a km or a k T of five millimolar, so it's five times that of GLUT3. Okay, and then GLUT2 is listed here, and it says again in activity two, calculate the percent Vmax for the GLUT transporters at four and eight millimolar. Of course, we've already done GLUT2, and then it says do the percent increase. So let's do that real quick for GLUT4, and then we'll be able to start to compare GLUT4 to GLUT2. Okay, um, and so let's let's just do this real quick. Again, it's it's the the km is five. Okay, so this would be essentially four ninths of the Vmax. Okay, again, we would be substituting this with five. Okay, so five plus four is is, is nine. Okay, and that's going to be equal then to forty four percent of the Vmax. Okay, um, now let's go down here, uh, and in this case we would have eight thirteenths of the Vmax, which is equal to sixty one point five percent. Okay, 
Now, we could then do our percent increase, and our percent increase would then be 61.5 minus 44 over 44 times 100. Put this, and that's going to be equal to a 39.7% increase. Okay, all right. All right, now, this transporter, GLUT4, is going to be found um, in primarily adipose tissue and also the skeletal muscle. Okay, um, and so you can see, again, based off of kinetics here, we don't have quite the, the change of percent increase um, that we see in, in GLUT2, but it is greater than that of GLUT3, okay, um, because of its, right, lower KM than GLUT2, but it's higher KM than GLUT3, okay? Now, let's go on and look at activity two, because there's something else that we need to consider with this. It says, let's pause here and think about this by answering a few questions. What else do we know about GLUT4? So maybe pause it and think to yourself, what do I know about GLUT4 based off of what we've talked about, okay? Okay, and so hopefully you've come to an answer now, and let me jog your memory with this, okay? GLUT4 is what we would call insulin sensitive, okay? Uh, meaning that GLUT4 resides in vesicles within adipose tissue as well as skeletal muscle um, tissue when insulin signaling is not present, okay? Meaning it's not found in the plasma membrane. I mean, there's a small amount of it in the plasma membrane, but it's not found to the extent that it will be when, and when insulin is present, okay? So what you're looking at here, okay, and let me just remind you here, I'll go ahead and draw this in half, okay? What you see on the left is an adipose cell, okay, where the GLUT transporter, GLUT4, has been tagged with a green fluorescent protein, okay? So it's, it's right where you see all that green is where the GLUT4 is. It co-localizes with, uh, with green fluorescent protein, okay? On the left, that's no insulin. When you then put insulin into the mix, you move from the left to the right, okay, and you'll notice what happens to the green. It goes from essentially here, okay, and it moves to the edge of the cell in a very significant way, okay, so that the majority of that green is going to be found in the plasma membrane of the cell. Okay, it mobilizes, those vesicles mobilize and put all that GLUT4 into the membrane. Okay, so that's what happens when insulin signaling is present. Okay, so let's come back up to here. It says, given this, is our percent increase calculation for these tissues an underestimate or an overestimate? Now remember, what we're talking about here is we're thinking about a scenario in which glucose concentrations go from 4 millimolar to eight millimolar, okay? So we've just eaten a meal and all of a sudden glucose concentrations go up in the bloodstream, okay? And so when we look at this percent increase, okay, for GLUT4, is that an underestimate or an overestimate based off of this information? To pause it, think about it, what do you think? Okay, well, hopefully what you came to is that that's an underestimate. Okay, and the reason that it's an underestimate is because when we go from 4 to 8 millimolar, the insulin concentrations in the bloodstream are going to go up because the pancreas, with, equipped with its GLUT2 transporter, is going to detect the blood glucose concentrations went up. It's going to secrete insulin, okay, and then that insulin is going to cause this scenario. Okay, now, well, how do we know that's an underestimate then. Well, let me say this, okay? What we have not been saying is that this value of Vmax, okay, is equal to the uh, Kcat, which we won't really talk too much about Kcat right now because it doesn't matter in this discussion, but we will talk about this next parameter, and that's the concentration of the enzyme, or the total concentration of the enzyme, or in this case, transporter. Okay, so Vmax is equal to Kcat, which is a constant for GLUT4, and the amount of the transporter or enzyme that is on or in the plasma membrane. Well, that 
has a significant increase. Okay, when we go from four millimolar, we could say that this is four millimolar, no insulin, to eight millimolar, where there is insulin. Okay, and so because there is this fairly significant increase in the E total, this V max and this V max, oops, sorry, I should write this out, 61.5% of the V max, that V max is going to be, those two are actually not the same. They're not a constant because we're changing E total because insulin is present. Okay. In fact, let's just say this. What if this, let's assume that this doubled when we went from here to here. And if it doubled, then in reality, this is not going to be 61.5% Vmax. It would be 123% of the original Vmax value. Okay, The original Vmax value being this. Because our E total has increased or has doubled, the amount of transporter on the membrane is, is now doubled. Okay, So in that case, then, we have to come back here and we'd have to substitute that for 123 Okay, and what our new percent increase would be would be 179% increase. Wow, now that's massive, right? It's even bigger than this, okay? Meaning that there is a 179% increase in the muscle and adipose tissue's ability to absorb glucose when glucose concentrations are going up, right? Now, there's some more questions here. It says, well, what does this, our answer to the above question, tell us about the possible role that muscle and adipose tissue play in maintaining steady state blood glucose concentrations? Well, it means that they play a significant role in actually absorbing glucose and bringing glucose concentrations down. Okay, it, Especially when you start to consider the amount of muscle and adipose tissue that is on the body relative to, let's say, the pancreas or the brain, right? A much more significant amount of our body is muscle and adipose tissue relative to then the brain and the pancreas, okay? And they have this massive increase in their ability to interact with glucose or absorb glucose, and therefore they are going to play a significant role in bringing glucose concentrations down, okay? Now, our last question, our last thing to do here, it says, is there additional regulatory mechanisms in place with regard to absorption of glucose into these tissues? And the answer to that question is, of course there is. Okay, And the reason is, is because we don't want those tissues to just have this unfettered access to glucose, this huge percent increase to glucose, because they can actually put us in a dangerous situation. They can absorb glucose so efficiently that they can deplete the glucose in the in the bloodstream almost entirely. All right, so that would be a bad thing. So, what are some of these additional regulatory mechanisms? Well, let's envision our membrane here, and let's just say that this is GLUT4. And we'll only draw one of them. Of course, there will be multiple of these now in the membrane. Okay, and we know this that glucose is being absorbed into these cells. Now, when glucose is absorbed in these cells, what happens to it? It's trapped. It's trapped by the trapping reaction, meaning that hexokinase will convert glucose and ATP to glucose 6 phosphate and ADP. And our enzyme is going to be hexokinase. Okay, HK hexokinase. Okay. Now, we know this also, okay, and we'll talk more about this in upcoming um, lectures, but the glucose, glucose 6-phosphate, is going to go on and be converted to pyruvate by glycolysis. Okay, and in the case of exercise, let's say, right, muscle of course is, is is contracting, lots of ATP is being used, and therefore the rate of glycolysis will be fairly high. Okay, um, however, in the case of rest, uh, the gly glycolytic rate is going to be fairly low, and so what's going to happen in the case of rest? Okay, is that this glucose 6-phosphate will start to accumulate and it can actually feed back and inhibit hexokinase. 
All right. So in the case of rest, glucose 6-phosphate will accumulate fairly rapidly. That will inhibit hexokinase. That will slow down this trapping reaction. And pretty soon, the concentrations of glucose inside the cell and outside of the cell will equal each other. And the rate of this and the absorption of this will go down. Okay, because the backward rate, because glucose concentration in here is going up, the backward rate is going to start to increase. Okay, and that's a regulatory mechanism to ensure that our muscle cells don't absorb lots and lots and lots and lots of glucose and just deplete the, the blood of glucose, causing us to potentially go brain, dam uh, brain dead. Okay, right, so um, in, we could talk about adipose tissue and how it uses glycolysis. It, will make actually lipids. Um, it will take glyco glycolysis and convert it to pyruvate, and the pyruvate will be converted to acetyl-CoA, and acetyl-CoA will be converted to lipids, and that rate will be high depending on um, the types of signaling that it's receiving. And there's lots of lots of interesting things that we could talk about here. Okay, insulin will actually be a signal to do that for adipose tissue. Okay, and there's other regulatory mechanisms that I don't want to get into all of them and overwhelm you. Okay, but these are some things um, to certainly think about. Okay. All right, so that does it for this worksheet, and hopefully this brings some context to you in regards to glucose absorption in these different glute transporters and why they're found uh, in different tissues and how that affects the function and the physiology of those tissues. Okay, take care.